Hello everyone, this is Beatles Examiner Steve Marinucci welcoming you to another edition of Things We Said Today, our weekly discussion of all things Beatle that takes us anywhere and everywhere. Um, let me, uh, before we talk about what we're going to be talking about, let me introduce my uh, co-host first, uh, or the host of the radio show Every Little Thing, uh, Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And I should say to my virtual right, because they're all on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast, or I guess depending on which way I'm looking. But uh, to my vert to the other side of the country, also um, uh, writing for a Beetle Fan Magazine and an author in his own right, uh, and I'm not talking about John Lennon. First, we have Mr. Al Sussman. Hey, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And also uh, out on the East Coast, um, another author in his own right, also writing for Beetle Fan and many other publications, um, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And we have, uh, we're going to talk today. Uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion on the internet this week about Keith Richards' comments about Sergeant Pepper being rubbish um that got a lot of a lot of blowback from people a lot of you know comments uh of people complaining about you know keith and about the stones and about the, talking uh, about the beatles and we thought we would go through that today and we have a special guest and you you know the special guest if you've been hanging around the show for a while because he's the gentleman who wrote our theme music, our great theme music, but he also is a Stones fan and he's going to try and defend the Rolling Stones on a Beatles show. And that would be, <laughs> and that would be Mr. Michael Lynch. Hello, Michael. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And uh, let we, me just... We've got, we're, we're, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, we're ganging up on you four to one. Well, but go ahead, go ahead. well let, me, let me just make this clear. I mean... Um, I know a lot of you guys know me as the Stones fan, but the truth is I am a huge fan of both groups. And whereas some of you have seen me on the Beatle boards defending the Stones, if you had been on the Stones boards, there have been plenty of times where the tables have been turned and I'm defending the Beatles. So I have been on both sides of the fence, and it is an interesting place. It it, it definitely is. It definitely is. Let's, I mean, let's start about the, the whole thing any, uh, anyway. I mean... I really found, and and anybody uh, anybody that wants to come in on this, you know, say so. In reading his comments in context, I didn't think he was really complaining that much about Sergeant Pepper because he was talking about both Pepper and their Satanic Majesty's request, and he basically said that both out al- he he didn't like either one. Did did anybody? Anybody want to want to talk on that and you know and tell me what you think? Well, I, I, well, I think I think Keith, much like John Lennon, Keith tends to say things just almost for the shock value of what they're going to look like in print, mm-hmm. and you know he may not completely believe what he's uh, what he's actually saying, but just to just to you know throw a zinger out there. I mean, after all, uh, Keith is a huge Beatles fan. I mean, it was, in fact, it was Keith who, in 2005, uh, suggested that, that Paul begin performing uh, Please Please Me. Mm-hmm. That's right. And there's an outtake out there of him doing Please Please Me, as I recall, <laughs> that is actually really, really good. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, you know, it's just him in the studio alone. But it's it's a lot of fun to listen to. He he did a, a great little ad lib version of it, you know. Yeah. So I, I agree that he does tend to to open his mouth and you know and say things. I mean, he that's the way he is with everything. I mean, he's that's his personality. But I, the whole thing. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I think he, I think he he meant it at face value. I I don't see why not. I mean, I. I'm sure Keith hated Satanic Majesty's request just as much as he hated Sergeant Pepper. And I think he basically was blaming Sergeant Pepper for them doing Satanic Majesty's request because, um, as, as John Lennon used to point out, you know, just look at what we did and see what the stones do two months later, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that they, you know, I, I think in both case, I think 
I think it's probably a little unfair to look back at it that way because it was heading into that psychedelic era where everybody was doing stuff, not just the Beatles. And um, it was, that was just the, the, the sound of the times. And um, you know, I really like Satanic Majesty's request of it. Uh, apparently, uh, apparently, I'm in the minority uh, among Stones fans, even. But um, right. I've always liked that album, and uh, so I think that you know Keith is like Keith is more of a hardcore blues guy, and he doesn't. I don't think he really wants to be involved with singing, you know, 2000 light years from home and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I I can see why he would have thought the whole thing was just, you know, not his cup of tea and pepper in the same way. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I took it pretty much at at face value. I think he meant it. Um, and, And I think that because so many stones fans, seem not to seem seem to feel that satanic majesties is some sort of embarrassment in their catalog um i think that he wouldn't have thought of it as being shock value for those people you know that he mm-hmm. he would expect them to agree so and that's just my take on it i kind of agree with uh exactly what that what alan said i think this this quote from keith is more a reflection of the direction that the stones were going into and the beatles because i think at heart he is an r&b guy a blues guy, and he liked, uh, you know, the more pure rock and roll, you know, simple, you know, guitars and drums, a little bit of piano, and probably didn't like the fact the Beatles were getting into psychedelic, and like Alan was saying, so many bands were doing that too. He didn't want the Stones to go in that direction. So, yeah, I'm sure that he also didn't like both those albums. So uh, I think it's more a reflection of the direction that both bands were going into. And that's kind of of proven out by the fact that the next two albums, next two Stones albums after Satanic Majesties were very much back to the roots. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Beggar's Banquet and Let It Bleed, you know, were very, very much of a return to the Stones, uh, you know, their, uh, the, you know, their, their best musical instincts. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a quote in the Esquire interview that, really kind of says it it says what he really feels about both albums he says after he said uh it was a mishmash of rubbish kind of like satanic majesties he said oh if you can make a load of shit so can we <laughs> so i mean i you know i mean that basically basically says how seriously they took it michael what do you have to say uh, I'm pretty much agreeing with uh, most of what you guys have said so far i'll say that when i first saw the quote i heard it i, I thought it was a pretty funny quote actually because uh when Keith uh, talks in an interview, he always seems very casual and, uh, you know, he, he laughs. He seems like a friendly guy in a good mood. So, like, when I read those comments from Keith, I pictured them like that. And it was easy to just think of him just saying that with a smile on his face. And I could find it funny. Whereas if Pete Townsend, who I love, you know, a great guy, I love Pete. But, you know, he often comes across as very sullen and bitter in his interviews. or You know, like a guy with a chip on his shoulder. I think it would take on a different context. And uh, I don't know. So, I mean... I, I just kind of laughed at the comments when I read it, you know, uh, and I knew it would be upsetting to a lot of fans, but I figured, you know, what the heck? It's Keith. I love the guy. Even if Mick had if Mick had said it, I think it, the it would have taken on a, a whole different tone. I, I think, agree. You, you know, you, you're absolutely right. And and um, I mean, it, it would have been I mean, every time, you know, when Mick says something, people get real serious about you know, about what he says. I, I think you're right, though. I think people tend to take, take Keith a lot less seriously. Alan, you mentioned something, I think it was on Facebook yesterday or, or in the emails when we were talking about this. You mentioned about uh, Keith's um, autobiography, and I looked it up, and he actually called Satanic Majesties a put-on, mm-hmm. um, yeah. which is which is another way of looking at it, because I... I never really thought of it as a as more. I mean, I thought they were fairly serious, but I guess I guess to think of it as a put on would have been, you know, is is puts a whole new light on the whole thing. Too. I never believed that. So, that I thought was was Keith saying something for shock value. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, listen, listen to that album. If, if if something is a put on, you know it's a little clearer and, and not to mention that, you know, there were lots of bootlegs of outtakes from the sessions. I think that, and they're working pretty seriously on these things and, mm-hmm. and, uh, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't buy it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> what about you, Michael? Well, 
let me just tell you where I stand on Satanic. I mean, I do prefer, you know, even though I'm supposed to be the Stones defender here, I do prefer Pepper to Satanic, but that's only really because uh, there's one or two cuts. On, I don't think there are any bad cuts on Sergeant Pepper, whereas there's one or two cuts on Satanic that I just, a gomper, I'm thinking. I don't, I don't really care for that oh. one too much. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, you know, just for uh, point value, that's why I prefer uh, Pepper. Although I don't believe either album is either band's best album of 1967. So there's a thought for you. Huh. I actually, yeah, really? I, I actually prefer Magical Mystery Tour to Sgt. Pepper. I don't know why. I think I just like the songs better. But I prefer Between the Buttons to Satanic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I can... I can go with that. <laughs> that's an that's an interesting. That's an interesting. Yeah, yeah I, can, I, I can go with the latter. I'm not sure if I can go with yeah the, about hmm. the magical mystery tour, but I, I, I uh, maybe I th- I think I think that's largely because it's got "I Am the Walrus," which is one of my all time favorite songs. So that like takes extra point value. I don't know. Yeah, mm. we we may be demurring about that because it wasn't really an album, but um, yeah, but it kind of was here. So yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. it was, before you were born, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> you know sure when, when when um it's funny when Satanic Majesties came out. I think the track I liked best, and for a, a weird stereo wiring reason, um, was Citadel, because mm, great track. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really like that track, and um, and the way my house was wired, we had the stereo speakers in the in the living room, but for some reason, my my father had wired like the left channel only speaker into this other room, sort of where the washer and dryer was, and so I, you know, if I was folding up clothes or something, you know. I listen to Citadel and just hear the instrumental track, and I really like that <laughs> better than the whole track. Um, wow. But but you know, um, I think also in both cases, um, I'm not sure I want to admit this thing, seeing as I'm supposed to be essentially a musical guy. I think in both cases, the packaging comes into it too. I, I think of both Pepper and Satanic Majesties as the full package with the cover, with, you know, and Satanic Majesties, you have to admit, had a pretty special cover with the four Beatles in the picture. Mm -hmm. So um, there was, I don't know, there was just something about both of them that I really liked. And uh, I don't skip any cuts when I play Satanic Majesties either, not even sing this all together and see what happens or gomper. Also, you get to hear something from Bill Wyman, you know, in another yeah. land. I, I really right. like that too. I like that harpsichord, and the, you know, it's it, it just was uh, was was a bit different for them. And I liked what they had been doing before. Really liked what they did after. But I, I still have a soft spot for that album. One problem I do have with that album. I mean, all in all, I think it's a very good album. I enjoy it a lot. One problem I have is the sequencing because my three favorite songs on the album are. Uh, not necessarily in this order, but they are Sing This All Together, mm-hmm. Citadel, and In Another Land. Those are the first three songs on the album. So in other words, the album peaks early for me. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't like She's a Rainbow, Michael? I- I've gone back and forth on that one. I like it. I never really liked the ooh la la so i got to be honest. Uh, mm. But I think okay. it's a good song. I-, I, think it- I think one thing I never was too crazy about that song, the way it kind of stops and starts, which I guess is part of the effect, but I don't know, it's almost like it. I don't know, it's almost like it's slowing down, like there's a problem or something like that. I don't know. Actually, to give Satanic Majesty is kind of its its due, there were a whole bunch of albums that came out in the second half of 67 and the beginning of uh, the first three or four months of 68, which were very much, you know, uh, kind of based on the whole Sgt. Pepper idea, or at least influenced oh, yeah. by it. And most of them, after bathing with, uh, after bathing at Baxter's by Jefferson Airplane, uh, The Rascals, Once Upon a Dream, Vanilla had- Fudges, The Beat Goes On, which might be one of the worst albums ever made. Most of those, <laughs> most of those albums were really bad and were definitely not, not good fits for those particular bands. But Satanic Majesties, even with a little, you know, uh, with some some excess that, you know, was probably not necessary, it certainly was a hell of a lot better than The Beat Goes On. <laughs> uh-huh. I'll laugh at that, even though yeah. on the Long Islander, you're, you're insulting my local boys. Oh, yeah. that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, because the fudge were from Long Island, which that's is right. your, your neck of the woods. I am literally about 10 minutes away from where those albums were recorded, actually. Wow, really? Wow, really? 
It's now a laundromat. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. Ultrasonic Studios is now like a laundromat and a pet store, I think. Wow. The beat does rock not history. go on. Rock history, rock history lives. Oh, my right. God. What a, what a shame. But, I mean, you know, this whole thing, I mean, let's let's open it up a little further to the, the whole idea of the Beatles versus the Stones. And I, I know, you know, two books have been done on this, and I, I'm not trying – and uh, – Outside of what those books say, because I, I mean, those are not what we're talking about. I mean, among us, uh, among us, what do we think about the Beatles versus the Stones? Uh, okay, I'm gonna, Ken, I'm gonna start with you if you don't, if you don't mind, because you've been quiet. You've been too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd never hear you say that. <laughs> uh, no, I love both bands. You know, I don't really. Uh, the Beatles will always be the greatest band of all time for me, but. With all the great bands, they all have their own identity, and uh, you know the Stones have put out some of the greatest rock and roll of all time. I've mm-hmm. never, you know, said anything negative about the Stones through the years because when it comes to putting out not only the original songs that they've done, which is among some of the greatest rock songs ever, but I like the songs that they've covered too. You know, they are great at what they do. They're just not as um, musically eclectic as the Beatles have been, and I'm very much into eclecticism, you know, but that doesn't make them worse <laughs> or less of a band uh, for me because what they do, they do so well, you, you know, think, and it's you don't, and you, don't still... think the Stone, you don't think the Stones disco period made them ec- eclectic? Oh, no, no, no. There, there are different styles that the, that the Stones have done, but nowhere near to the degree that the Beatles have done, and that's also including all their solo music. Okay. You know, I love the country stuff that the Stones have done, like Far Away Eyes, you know, and I love the disco period, too, as huh. well. But by and large, I love, you know, the rock and roll and the R&B-based stuff. You know, uh, a song like um, Mixed Emotions, you know, it's one of my favorite yeah. of, their, of their more recent, well, that's it's going back now, but you know they're still great at putting out great songs with amazing hooks, and um, you know I I admire artists that really expand themselves musically and go in a lot of different directions, which is why I love the Beatles so much. It's one of the many reasons, but the Beatles went in you know so many different directions, from not just the the rock and the pop, but also country music some blues, the Indian music, the classical music, the psychedelic stuff. And then in the solo, you know, music they put out, they went even further. Mm-hmm. You know, Paul McCartney has gone gone through, you know, he's just recorded so many different styles now. George Harrison got into Oriental type music, you know. There's so many different styles that the Beatles have done that makes me admire them even more. But, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to putting out some great rock and roll, kick-ass rock and roll that still sounds so fresh, you know, the Stones are amongst the best that there is. But, you know, I love the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Kinks, all the great British bands because, you know, they, they have their own identity and they're all great at what they do. I don't necessarily like to say that one is the best, although the Beatles will always be the best for me. Mm-hmm. That's um, just how I feel. Okay. No, okay. I, I know I wasn't trying to interrupt you. I thought you were, I thought you were finished. Did you, did you want to say a little more or... Uh... No, no, I just wanted to add one thing about Keith's comment, which is uh, one of the developments that I like to bring up every now and then about the Beatles is that I've noticed how through the years uh, an album like Revolver has just, you know, people admire it so much more now than they ever have to the degree where they rank it higher than Sgt. Pepper, which Sgt. Pepper was always looked at as being the greatest rock album of all time on almost every single music poll, and... I think there has been a wave over the years, maybe the last couple of decades, in fact, where rock fans tend to prefer music that's that's produced that's simpler in terms of production, where it's not so layered and so complicated and artsy, <laughs> you know, like Sgt. Pepper became and Sgt. Pepper is. So Keith's comments fall in line with what a lot of rock fans and Beatle fans feel. I'm not saying everybody rates Revolver higher than Sgt. Pepper, although I think amongst this group there may be a few that do. But I'm just saying when I hear comments like that, there are a lot of fans who point to you know, the, the music of the Beatles that in terms of production was much simpler and in terms of songwriting was simpler, although they were always progressing. So 
it just falls in line with a lot of what I've heard in recent years when I think about that. Because I always think about this thing about Revolver. And I'm amazed and I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by it all, how Revolver has risen so highly in so many music polls as being not only the greatest Beatles album, but for some people, the greatest album of all time. So mm-hmm. there are a lot of people who like the music that's pre-1967. And I even remember recently somebody wrote into Facebook um, just bouncing off something that was said about the Beatles and looking at 1967 as their year of overindulgence. Mm. And there may be a lot of people who feel that way now. And then they went back to being a band again with the White Album, Mm -hmm. even though (laughs) a lot of the White Album had the Beatles working in different studios Mm. at the same time. But, you know, you know, I'm saying in terms of production, in terms of getting down to just being a rock and roll band, just guitars and drums and a little bit of piano and not much else and not so much studio musicians, you know, there are people who prefer that. So I think what Keith is saying is is similar to the way a lot of rock fans and Beatle fans feel. Alan? Yeah, you know, I I remember that whole Beatles Stones thing, and I, I never thought it was all that real, and it, it kind of wasn't. It was kind of, I think, produced um, by the Stones' early publicist who had worked for Brian for a while and sort of manufactured this business of, you know, the Beatles are all clean cut and the Stones are really rough and out there. And I think, you know, and I think a lot of people bought into that. I mean, it's funny because in in this interview we're talking about with Keith, Keith also says, says the same thing, right? I think he says, you know, everyone said the Beatles were so clean cut and we weren't, but they were just as bad as us. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and you know, and they were, but but there were these sort of two myths created, and I think that a, a lot of, of that, I you know, it, I guess it depended even besides the music, what kind of image appealed to certain people, and but I don't know, among all of my friends, we both were all big, we were all fans of both groups, um, and as you said, the Kinks and the Who and all that stuff. I mean, we uh, we waited for every new release from any of them. I mean, maybe more for the Beatles ones, because, you know, hey, they're the Beatles, you know what I mean? By definition, you know, what can you say? But I, I remember when, when Beggar's Banquet came out, and I think N.E.W. had probably an early acetate of it and was playing it on the air, and there was a lot of excitement, you know? I, when Jumpin' Jack Flash came out, everyone went crazy, you know? It was, uh, I, thought, I think it was really nice having these two groups that had some supposed theoretical tension, although if you'd been reading up on them closely, you knew that they were actually pals as well. You know, um, and I think also the to in the, in a sense maybe John's comments about the Stones um, repeating what they were doing two months later is kind of unfair because they were they were hanging out and playing each other unfinished things and you know and they were probably both getting ideas from each other. Um, I think this was um, really an incredibly fertile time in rock and roll. Everybody was getting ideas from everybody. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, look at the, the birds sort of liked, uh, hearing some 12 string stuff on hard days night. So they started doing their Dylan covers with 12 string. George Harrison Mm -hmm. hears that and does, uh, you know, if I needed someone and, you know, these things are all sort of same thing with the Beatles and the beach boys, you know, that whole rivalry where, you know, Brian heard, um, rubber soul and came up with pet sounds sort of as a challenge. And then he heard Sergeant Pepper and went crazy because come on, who can equal that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> apologies yeah. to Robert Rodriguez and the revolver contingent. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, I look at that and, you know, we're, it's gotten away a little, my, I've, I've gone off, off topic a little bit with the Stones and Beatles relationship too. You know, I, I think that that was a really healthy interplay that everybody had in those days. And I don't see it a lot now, you know, but what can you do? Well, oh, you don't see it as, as a rivalry. I don't think it was a real rivalry. You know, it might've been a real rivalry rivalry in the sense that, you know, everybody wants to have the number one record and if they're both out at the same time. But I I seem to remember John talking about how there was even sort of collusion so that the Stones and Beatles wouldn't have new singles out at the same time so that they wouldn't displace each other from being number one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wonder if we should get the... the Wasn't that said also about, (laughs) um, you know, other records then, like like the Motown records, the Supremes wouldn't put out a single at the same time the Beatles would. Hmm. They'd wait a couple of weeks. 
Yeah, well, possibly. Isn't that true? Uh, I don't yeah. really know, but uh, but of course it would make sense if you if you're a record company and you know a new Beatle record's coming out, you probably would uh, clear the decks. But but on the other hand, you yeah. know who knows? I mean, look. Can you hear us, Al, uh, amid all that? It, beneath the fumes for the bus, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, got a, you got a comment? Uh, yeah. Um, actually, uh, Alan makes an excellent, excellent point. But what I've, what has always stuck in my craw about the Stones over the years is this whole, and, and Michael has heard or seen this rant before, so uh, indulge me. <laughs> but, Bring it on. But <laughs> I've always had a major problem with this whole thing of the Stones being labeled the world's greatest rock and roll band. They weren't the world's greatest rock and roll band in the 60s. We know who that was. They weren't the world's greatest rock and roll band in the 70s. That was Led Zeppelin, you know, unless you're a particular fan of the Eagles. They weren't the world's greatest rock and roll band in the 80s. That was U2. And after that, it hardly mattered because by the 90s, it, you know, it, it had just gotten to the point where the Stones every few years, you know, would, you know, reunite to, you know, make uh, make some bucks and charge $500 for a ticket to, you know, an overblown concert. Um, so I just have never subscribed to the whole Stones being the world's greatest rock and roll band. But, uh, and, and also, frankly, you know, the, I would say, looking at it generously, I would say that after Tattoo You, uh, which is 1981, after that, there's not a whole lot in the Stones catalog that's really worth the attention of most people. And there are a lot of people, in fact, who will say that actually, you know, after Exile on Main Street, that was really the end of the Stones' prime period. And that's, uh, that's a long time ago. So uh, they certainly did. They, they did great work in the 60s. And, and yeah, as Alan points out, they were, I think there was a lot of cross-pollinization, if you will. Uh, there's even a shot of, uh, from the Revolver Sessions of John holding up a copy of the English uh, version of Aftermath, which, which I believe had just come out. And uh, so there was a lot of cross-pollination between the two bands. But, it, but after... I think after the Beatles broke up, the Stones kind of, even though a lot of people will say, well, that the 70s was their greatest period, I would say that's uh, up for argument. Let's put it that way. Well, I, I think, think a lot of that was, I think a lot of that was, was, me, was record company hype. Um, yeah. I mean, that greatest rock and roll band uh, was Sam Cutler's introduction to, the, to exactly. their stage shows. And, and, you know, I mean, it, you have... You had uh, Little Richard introduced as the king of rock and roll. You had, I mean, you know, you, I mean, that kind of, that kind of thing goes on. I mean, I think even, I think even Bo Dilly was introduced as the king of rock and roll. You know, I mean, that kind of thing goes on with whoever's playing on stage. And I don't know if you can take that seriously. I think it's the musical, the music that really counts. And while I will, I will say that, you know, the Stones put out some fantastic albums. I mean, that period through uh, exile on Main Street is absolutely mind blowing. You know, there was some. I agree, there was some drop off. Um, one of the Stones albums I really have had trouble listening to is Black and Blue. I do not yes. like Black and no, Black and Blue. Not at all. Now some some girls some girls I I like. I even I even I think in, I liked uh, Emotional Rescue and Tattoo Tattoo You. I think yeah. it was after. After tattoo you, where it started to drop off a little bit, and then it really oh. started to drop off. Yeah, um, I mean, I haven't run out to buy a Stones album in quite a while. I think I picked up Bigger Bang on, um, you know, on a use, uh, you know, as a used CD because I didn't run out and buy it when it first came out. So, uh, and um, I mean, I'm not, you know, they're the fact that they're still playing live is great. I'm not sure I'd really want to go see them now. Now I'm sorry I didn't go see them in in the '70s with Mick Taylor. That well, you know, I, 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 I really regret that. I really regret I didn't see them. Steve, I saw them. 
at Madison Square Garden in um, whenever it, in the summer of '72 during right. the uh, you know what I guess people have called the Ladies and Gentlemen the Rolling Stones tour. Right, right, right. And and I was in the blue seats at Madison Square Garden. And in those days, there were no video screens and all, so we right, yeah. were so we didn't have you know incessant shots of Mick with his eyeliner and the glitter mm-hmm. and all right. that stuff. And to me, sitting up there listening to them in the um, in the blue seats at Madison Square Garden, they weren't any better than most bar bands. Uh, mm. That I was hearing in that period. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I, I was... saw them. I saw them twice on that tour. Um, actually, both in the same day. Um, one up in the Blue Seats, and then the evening show in the twenty fifth row down downstairs. And that evening show was amazing. I, I, I might agree with you about the the early show because the distance and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, Mick Taylor played the most incredible solo on Love in Vain that I've ever heard. I mean, I've got all the bootlegs from the rest of the shows and they're not oh, quite so right. And um, I accidentally taped that show. And, um, oh, and, play it for us. And, play it for us. <laughs> well, it's out there now. Um, people yeah. have it. Uh, I've, I've seen it um, called something like Five English Gentlemen in a New York Garden or something. Um, so you, you should check that out because that, that I, I wish they would. Uh, I know they have um, soundboard tapes of that whole tour. They really should put that show yeah. out or, or at least that track. But, there are uh, some there are some dynamite shows from from that era that Brussels show that they finally put out themselves. Yes, uh, yeah, is absolutely amazing. I mean, oh my god, that is that is just dynamite. That Mick Taylor guitar is just fantastic. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I you know it, it, there were some shows in that period where they were absolutely stunning. There's no question about it. But yeah, I think they definitely did drop off after that. Michael, do you want to defend them here? Or? Well, first of all, as for those uh, Madison Square Garden shows in '72, Al, were, were you at the afternoon show? I think it was the afternoon show. Yes. Okay, because I've seen films and clips of that, and yeah, that did not sound so good. Because no. I mean, I think that I think that was the show that uh, there were films of it on the Dick Cabot show that was from around that time. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, okay. Uh, yeah. I have seen. That clip. I have seen that clip. Actually, that clip is on the Dick Cavett DVD. If you right the, mm-hmm. the Shout Factory DVD, it's right. actually been released legitimately. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. That that is uh that's not a good example of that tour. But if that's the one you saw, that I can understand why you felt that way. So. Yeah. But as for the dropping off at the period, yeah, I mean, I can definitely see that they went. Um, I've heard different um uh different fans say different uh, albums for when they started going downhill, and I can see the cases in a lot of them. I mean. After Exile on Main Street, the next album was Goat's Head Soup, which had some good songs, but was not as strong as the ones just before it. Yeah. And there was It's Only Rock and Roll, which I like a lot, actually, but I know yeah, I'm... That's good. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Um, it's a great song. Yeah. I mean, the side... I think everything on side... I think most everything on side one is excellent, uh, and then everything else, I think, is a hit and miss. Yeah, Tattoo You was great, and then it dropped for a little bit, but I think it picked up for a little bit. I, I really liked... Um, Oh, I'm such a fan. I don't even remember the name of the album. Uh, some girls. Some girls. Some no, no, some no. Girls. After some girls. Um, emotional, emotional, emotional rescue. rescue. No, no, no. I'm going. I'm going uh, several albums later. Um, Tattoo you. Steel Wheels. I'm, I'm going. I'm going all the way to Steel, Steel yeah. Wheels. Yep. Really? I thought that, I thought that was a good. Um, I thought it was a very good album. Um, and even Stones fans disagree with me on this one. A lot of them do. Voodoo Lounge, which was the next studio album after that. I thought that was a very good album. I really like that one. I still mm. play that one a lot. Mm. And the ones that have come out since then, which would be uh, Bridges to Babylon and uh, Bigger Bang, mm-hmm. I thought they were good. I mean, I never thought, I mean, you might think I'm being a little biased here. I never thought there was any Stone Studio album that was completely terrible. That didn't have at least something that was, there's some that definitely percentage was lower than others. And it's probably the same albums you're thinking about, you know, uh, the 80s albums, uh, Dirty Work, um, uh, Undercover. They had yeah. some songs I liked, but yeah, there was definitely they definitely went downhill for a little bit for that. But I thought they made a nice recovery. Bigger Bang, I was sort of in the middle with. I actually think that their '70s output was phenomenal. I love their music of the '70s, and maybe their albums weren't consistently strong, but there's enough really strong tracks. You know, if you were to do a, a compilation of great uh, Rolling Stone songs, you've got so many of them. Sure. I mean, in the '70s alone, uh, you know, you talk about Black and Blue. Memory Motel is one of my favorite songs of theirs. 
Mm-hmm. And you can you can pick you can cherry pick tracks from all their albums, even you know in the decades that followed, and you can find some really great great songs in there. Oh yeah, as a shortage. singles as a singles band, they're phenomenal. Yeah, they put out some great singles throughout Absolutely. all the decades. Absolutely. So. You know, and I love the disco period. I thought Miss You was a terrific track. I loved Emotional Rescue. You know, I loved all that stuff. I didn't dismiss that at all. And, um, yeah, like I said, Mixed Emotions is one of my favorite songs. I loved Harlem Shuffle. I thought that was a terrific cover. I, I, I did, you too. Know? I thought that was excellent. The video on that was wonderful. <laughs> and and you know, I, the only... I also like Stripped. I thought Stripped was great. Stripped has mm. some good so. things. I really like the version of... Uh... Slipping away on that, I really like that. But I'd always like that song anyway. So, the only complaint I'd ever make about the Stones, and it's the the kind of thing that John Lennon said, and I don't agree with everything John said, but he said that so much of what they did is just you know a reworking of stuff that they've done already, and you know in terms of production from Exile on Main Street, so much of their albums sound exactly the same, almost as if they could have all been recorded during the same time period. But I still love that production. You know, there's a brightness, there's a punchiness to, to the production that I really like. So, um, you know, if you love that kind of music, then the Stones are more your band. And I think one of the limitations with the, with the Stones is that there are really only so many hundreds of ways that you can rework a Chuck Berry riff. And, yes. You know, exactly. that's basically the, the DNA of most of the Stones catalog. Yeah. Um, so, and in fact, I mean, I thought it was it was great seeing Keith on that special with Chuck Berry. You know, mm-hmm. when he produced that and uh, Taylor Hackford made it into a film and there's that one rehearsal where Keith is playing the intro. And, you know, let's face it, if one person on Earth besides Chuck Berry can do a characterful Chuck Berry intro, it's Keith. He's playing the intro and Chuck keeps stopping and saying, ah, come on, come on, do it right. And at one point he turns his back to Chuck and towards the camera and just rolls his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great scene. But, yeah, mm. you know, anyway. It's still a skill to be able to write more Chuck Berry esque songs, you know. Even Paul McCartney said it as far as, you know, fifties rock and roll. A lot of people think that it's so easy to write songs in that style, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So to to be able to come up with all the different riffs that, that Keith has, that is a talent to itself. And to be able to build a song around that, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I really, um, you know, I think that is a talent. It's, it's he's, you know, it's definitely a, you know, a talent that that Keith has. Let me let me ask another question. Who, and this is probably a, a an obvious answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who progressed further musically in their career, the Stones or the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> This is all- Alan, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you start. I mean, that's <laughs> such a, is that a softball question or what? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think the Stones were necessarily concerned with the idea of musical progression. I'm not even sure the Beatles mm. were, but they, but they did it. You know, I mean, they, they were always looking for new things. I don't think the Stones were particularly always looking for new things. I think it, at heart. They really wanted to keep playing blues and Chuck Berry and that kind of stuff. And I think they may have sort of got sucked along in the Beatles' wake, you know, as their big friendly competitors um, of like, okay, let's try some of this stuff too. But, you know, as soon as the Beatles weren't there anymore, they basically went back to, you know, apart from the disco thing, which, um, uh, sorry, Ken, I I loathe everything disco in any form and it, you know i don't like when the okay. stones do it. i don't like it when mccartney does it you know uh, you know and sorry yeah oh, please so um yeah you know so they did some experiments there but i obviously i don't consider that musical progression i don't you know it seems to me if you listen to the most recent stone studio stuff you don't see a huge amount of musical progression. I mean, they're they're much more facile players. You know, they're 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 better than they were on their first albums. But um, it's not like the distance from "I Want to Hold Your Hand" to "Strawberry Fields" has been covered. You know. No, I think Brian Jones really was the one most responsible for the, the you know the musical adventurousness that the Stones showed in the mid. Hmm you know, in the mid sixties and, you know, he might've, uh, might've gone even further if he hadn't gotten sucked into the, you know, the, the vortex of drugs and, you know, basically just became so burned out that he just, you know, had 
no more usefulness to the group to the group when uh, yeah. when Mick and Keith dumped him in in uh, in '69. I hate to keep lashing back on the Stones, but you know I hate I loved when they did Black Limousine, and I was I was hoping that that would be a taste of more to come, and it wasn't. It was just a, mm. a one one shot deal, and I because I really thought they were great. You know they were great. Some of those blues songs on those early albums are wonderful. You know they they had the, the instrumentation. Mick was a great singer, you know, and they they just played really well. And, and I was really sorry that that whole thing didn't continue. Uh, Michael, do, do you do you agree with that, or does that strike a chord with you, or a little bit? Because um, as far as the Stones and progression, whereas let's say the Beatles or McCartney, they might try on a new style for an album, or mm-hmm. uh, you know, for more than just one track. I think the Stones over the years they might you know try a different style for one track on an album, but then you know then they're on to the next thing or or they're back to what they were doing. Um, but as for the progression, I mean, to go back in years, I mean, let's go back to the 60s for a minute. Um, obviously, when the Beatles released Rubber Soul, I mean, that was quite different from the albums before then. And, you know, that's considered a leap forward. And then the next Stones album after that, and I don't think it was uh, necessarily copying them, but I mean, the first Stones album of 1966 was Aftermath. And... Um, that was a pretty diverse album, pretty musically. I think maybe even more than Rubber Soul. I'm not saying it's better than Rubber Soul, but if you you know you made a list of all the different types of styles on Aftermath, mm. I think uh, I think it's quite a list. And then and then of course I admit that you know when Revolver came out, you know that you know that outdid it. But uh, so for a minute there, they really were, you know, so for a few months there, I think the Stones did have the most progressive rock album. Interesting, but it, but it, but it didn't last long. Michael, um, Alan touched on this earlier, but. John's comments about the Stones copying the Beatles, you know, two months later. Do you think that um, that John was being unfair, or do you think that there's some accuracy to that? I'm somewhere in the middle about that. You see, some of John, I mean, there are a couple the cases that John cites, and then I'll get into the cases that uh, I won't list them all. But uh, some of the cases John cited, some of them have some uh, validity. Um, some of them I might give the Stones uh, an out on a reasonable doubt. And there's some that just don't make sense, either because of chronology or for other reasons. But then, the, but then I've seen the fans of the Beatles when they're ragging on the Stones and they're saying, "Oh, this was the Stones copying this." Uh, some of it gets into uh, like Paul is dead clue territory. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, hmm. but just to run by some of the examples, John said. Now he said, uh, "As tears will go by, it was a copy of yesterday." I could see that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can't really defend that one. Although part of me wonders if maybe part of that was sort of a, sort of a put on. I mean, not a put on, but sort of like, okay, you guys, you think you're so smart. You did an acoustic song with strings. We can do it too, you guys. But you know, I think their heart was in it too. But I blame Andrew mostly on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, Satanic Majesty's request, effort. You know, can't really say too much to defend that one. Um, but the one that I never understood. Well, two that John said that I really can't go with. Number one, when he said "We Love You" was a copy of "All You Need Is Love." I don't hear it. And that's aside from the fact that uh, I've seen different recording dates given for We Love You, but uh, the ones that John Wynn says in his book predate All You Need Is Love. So that, that should, if that's right, that would put an end to it right there. But I mean, I don't hear any similarity between those two songs at all. But then the one that really uh, I thought was kind of off was, uh, didn't John say that he thought that Miss You was a copy of his Bless You? I didn't ever hear that. You've told me that. I I, I don't remember Uh, that. Whoa, I haven't seen that one. I think I saw that. I think uh, Robert Rodriguez uh, mentioned that on uh, his board. I think that's Mm. where I saw that. Mm. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a little baffled. Other than the title and the fact that, you know, John does go uh, something on, which, you know, kind of sounds like the riff of Miss You, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a copy of Coming Up. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Michael. I'm not sure what the chronology is, but they're both rattling around the same garbage pail here. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. Al. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> you're, you're, did you call coming up garbage? Oh, uh oh, uh oh, ding, ding, ding. Okay, in this corner. <laughs> Al, it sounded like you were going to ask something to me. Defend, well, def- is it, uh, is defend it, yourself, it, Alan. Is it Ken a disco song? I don't call it a disco song. First of all, the the live version is not. No, certainly not. You know the, the, the studio the, the, one. I don't really studio one. The studio one I don't consider to be disco. Mm. I don't really think of it as disco. Mm. Hmm. You know that all falls into that same category. There are a lot of people who think "Goodnight Tonight" is disco, and Lawrence Juber told me it's not a disco song. Oh, it's no, a dance oh, track. Yeah. You know, it depends upon you know your ears and what you're hearing. 
So I never thought of coming up as being disco. Hmm. Plus, you know, it, it, when it came out, it was right at the height of the, of, you know, the as I call them, the disco sucks wars. And, <laughs> and the fact that it was on a 12 inch single and, and, and CBS particularly insisted on calling those 12 inch singles disco singles. So mm. it immediately it could have been, you know, uh, Leonard Cohen. And uh, if he had put out a 12 inch <laughs> single, people would have said, sure, it's, it's a disco record. It's on, it's on a 12 inch. Uh, although I got to say, when when uh, when that came out, uh, the bass line, that made me think he was doing like a disco. It sounded to me like a disco type bass line, but maybe I'm just reaching. A little bit. For coming no, up? I agree. A little bit. Oh, I thought you were talking about uh, Good Night Tonight. Oh, we, we talked about both. So, Actually, yeah. Either. Hmm. Okay. Either one. Michael wanted to ask you a question about Nick. Okay. As a uh, you know, as a performer, because you know, in recent years he's appeared on various award shows or on Saturday Night Live or right. uh, you know, and and has absolutely wiped up the floor with any of these you know the these young bands. And I just uh, was wondering where you kind of stand uh, on uh, uh, mix abilities as a performer and as a front man, say, in comparison to a Roger Daltrey, a Bono, and other, you know, contemporaries and semi-contemporaries of his. Uh, it's a tough question. Well, first of all, um, Roger Daltrey and Bono are two people that, I mean, I used to be a big Who fan. I still like the Who a lot. But mm-hmm. I haven't really, I haven't really followed the recent years, so I don't really, I couldn't really compare you to what Roger's been doing recently. Sure. Um, you two, I kind of um, haven't followed in a long time. But you know, just to sum up, Mick as a as an an entertainer, I guess that's what you're asking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I th- I think he can do a great job. I mean, I thought he was great on SNL and uh, some of the award shows I've seen. And when I hear people that aren't generally Stones fans, as I did at the time of these appearances, that were saying, "Oh, he was really good." Yeah. I figured he must be doing something right. So uh, yeah, he's 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 got charisma, charisma, as uh, David Lederoff would say, about, yeah. uh, about himself. Uh, so uh, yeah, he's he's still got it. Yeah, he's great at doing comedy. He is great at doing comedy. I tell you. Yeah, he's so that one that one sketch on Saturday Night Live with uh, Mike Myers and him, where Mike Myers is playing Mick Jagger and Mick is playing Keith. <laughs> that was classic. Yes, is, <laughs> that is that was so good. I mean. Mick was so spot on with Keith, oh. and who would know him better? So. <laughs> no, that was great. Anybody? Anyway, <laughs> anyway yeah. Uh, anyway, um, anybody? Anybody have anything uh, short uh, items or tips or anything they want to bring up? Well, one thing about you know, again, the Beatles versus Stones uh, comparison, um, you have to have to take into account is the fact that it took the Stones about a year to really take off in, in America. Now, you know, they did it a lot quicker in England. It was by really about the third record, but in, in this country, it really took until, even though, you know, even though tell me and time is on my side and then heart of stone were, you know, were moderate hits. It really took until the last time for them to really take off here and of course, then then again, the next record was Satisfaction, which you know put them over the top as the number the number two band in in the world. But Satisfaction it, just had its an, its fiftieth anniversary, I think, exactly, last month, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, just to play devil, devil, devil's advocate, um, <laughs> you 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 could argue that perhaps. If, if Mick and Keith were going to play John's game, they could say that um, Day Tripper was in some ways ripped off of Satisfaction because yes. they're both songs start mm-hmm. with a memorable guitar riff. Same key. And, uh, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> I, you know, I, I never really noticed that about Day Tripper until a few um, few years ago when I was doing a podcast. I was going to do um, features where, and I did one of this like this, where I would take a particular Beatle record and I would play other records that came out in England around the same month, you know, right in the same month, just so you could see what their contemporaries were issuing at the same time. And uh, when I was looking at the records that came around the time of Day Tripper, I saw several 45s by other bands that sounded to me like they could have been uh, all inspired by Satisfaction. And, and when I saw Day Tripper, you know, at the same time, that made me think, well, maybe that was too. And then I thought about the, uh, the drum beat in the middle, you know, with that, you know, the snare on all fours like you hear in the bridge. <laughs> um, you know, because some of the other records that were out around that time were... Um, 
I forget which one it was. One of the Dave D. Dozy, Beaky, Stills and Nash. Oh, uh, Bend It? No, it wasn't Bend It. Um, huh? It might have been You Make It Move. I'm not sure. Hmm. I don't think it was Hold Tight. But uh, And then he got Keep On Running by Spencer Davis, right. you know, which is that same kind of beat in the fuzz guitar. And uh, not as obvious. I never would have thought of this until I saw it in the chronology. If you know the zombie song, Is This the Dream? Hmm. The chorus of that is kind of satisfaction you know it's got that e to the d but in the e root i'm, I'm being geeky now so i'll, I'll stop but uh <laughs> well you know but, if you mm. like if you like to do that sort of thing i mean here are two that didn't come out at the same time but they're fundamentally the same song the beatles drive my car and Jimi hendrix cross town traffic oh yeah mm-hmm. they both have yeah. that do 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 beatles have it in the right. baseline hendrix has it right up front and they're both about you know one's about traffic one's about cars that's right you know mm-hmm. i think i think there's a de- very definite connection there i never and thought about that but you're right wow yeah, and i never thought enough, about that and oddly yeah, enough uh, both of those songs have been used uh by radio stations for as their traffic beds <laughs> mm-hmm. on, well it makes sense depending on yeah. the format yeah sure Sure. Well, anyway. But actually, the, the guitar riff that um, the Beatles used in Day Tripper was borrowed from um, Watch Your Step hmm. from Bobby Parker. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, John Lennon played that on the interview with Dennis Elsis. Right. And that's also where they got, I think, the um, the riff from I Feel Fine is from there. Yeah. Hmm. I think, it, I think so, it's kind of more yeah. obvious on, my, on I Feel Fine than it is on Day Tripper, but it's definitely there on that. Yeah. So, but I mean, with everybody borrows from exactly which from, we, uh, other artists, so. which brings up a point, and that's uh, one little thing that annoys me a little bit about when I hear Beatles fans going off on uh, the Stones as you know copying. Is that I often hear, uh, I often hear Beatles fans talk about Beatle records and say, "Oh, this was influenced by this. This was influenced by this record." But if the same sort of degree of influence is on a Stones record, they call it copying, and sometimes <laughs> I don't think that's fair. For example, they'll say, uh, "They'll say I saw her standing there was." Uh, you know, uh, influenced by talking about you, but 19th Nervous Breakdown was a complete ripoff of <laughs> Beatle <Italy> Daddy. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, that doesn't sound fair to me. It's like I think the difference between uh, being influenced by and being derivative of something shouldn't be based on, you know, what you think of the group doing it. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think there's a, I think sometimes in the Beatles versus Stones uh, critique, on both sides I see this. So I'm yeah. not just bashing Beatles fans here. Um, I don't want to do it because I am one. Uh, but uh, I think uh, they're both guilty of a little hypocrisy, hip, hypocrisy now and again. Hypocrisy. Okay. Yep. Okay. Very true. Well, this and that, that, a, this... uh, I was just going to cap that by just saying this. So, so that's that's why in both boards, I, on both Beatle boards and Stones boards, I'm often seen as the guy, you know, Beatle boards see me as the Stones guy, Stones boards see me as the Beatles guy, when really what I am, I'm the... Can't we all just get along, guy? Right. <laughs> yeah. Because I love both groups, and you know, and, and uh, I got into the Stone. I got into the Beatles first, and the Stones. It was actually just because I had collected all the Beatles records. It was almost like, okay, what do I do now? Oh, the Stones, of course. But uh, that was before I knew that. Uh, you know, I think that was before I even knew about the rivalry, whether it exists or not, or you know how to what degree it exists. But I mean, I just heard records I liked, you know, and uh, there may be more overall brilliance in the Beatles records, but you know, my ears. Uh, just like the Stones records too. So there's something to like about everything, mm-hmm. and that's where I that's 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 my own stand on it. Anyway, gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been this has been really uh, in, uh, really uh, enlightening. We all uh, uh, I, I think we all got a lot out of this, and we all learned something and uh, looking at, looking at it from a different perspective. Um, so, Michael, for, first of all, thank you for for coming aboard um again michael is the is the author of the theme of this show that you hear every week uh so let's give a big round of applause to michael yeah thank you thank you thank you and the official official name of that piece the official name of that piece of music is theme for theme for ken and steve i guess i better change that now (laughs) but uh i have to call it theme for ken and steve because uh the title things we said today that already been taken oh okay and uh, uh yeah, I know who did. Who did? And and you have a um, you are a performer, and you uh, are performing in the uh, uh, New York, New Jersey area, correct? Ah, uh, yes. Um, one gig I'll bring up because it does have a little bit of Beatles relevance. Um, September nineteenth at Randy's now Man, uh, Randy Now's Man Cave in Bordertown, New Jersey. Uh, I'll be performing on a bill 
I'll be playing the bass for somebody some of you may have heard of. Her name is Palmyra Del Ran. She uh, was in a band in the 90s called The Frigs, an all-girl band on the underground scene, the garage scene. Uh, she works as a soloist now. I'm her bass player. And she's, out, she's, she's also now, you might have heard her, she is a uh, DJ on Little Steven's Underground Garage on the Sirius Network. Oh, you can hear oh on, okay. You can, you can hear her on uh, Sunday mornings at 8 to noon on the East Coast. But the reason I said it's got a little Beatles significance, this gig, is because also on that gig are some friends of Ken's, the Gripweeds. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, they just put out a brand new album, which is great, called How I Won the War. And, of course, you know how they got their name and how they got the title sure. of the album. But mm -hmm. they also cover the inner light on the new album. But they're, right. it's a great – they put out really strong, edgy rock and roll that's melodic. So if that's what you're into, as most Beatle fans are, then you should check out that band, The Gripweeds. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, anyway, Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure, and thank you for having me on the show. I yeah. Time. Um, you're, thank you. you're welcome. And next time we need somebody to defend the stones <laughs> – <laughs> no, seriously, you, you did. You did a great. Uh, you were great. You really well, thank, were. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I got to say, you, I, I didn't really have to defend them too much today. I think we all seem to be on the same page on a lot of what we said today. Yeah, basically. yeah. We didn't. Hit, we didn't. Hmm. We didn't hit them hard enough, guys. Yeah, we, we better start over. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Right, anyway, um, anybody? Any? Any? Uh, anybody got anything to mention uh, uh, upcoming this week uh, that uh, that uh, we should let people? Well, know? I. I have something I'd like to plug on my website because I'd like to tell all of our listeners to be on the watch for two very big special contests that I have going, one of which times perfectly with the 50th anniversary of the Beatles at Shea because Dave Swenson has been a great guest on our show. And also, I've done an interview with him privately, which you can catch on my website. I'm giving away his two books on the Beatles, The Beatles at Shea Stadium and The Beatles in Cleveland. That should be around the time when... This show gets posted for the first time. And then also, not long after that, I'm going to be giving away the new John Lennon vinyl box set, wow. courtesy of Universal Music. So wow. that'll be coming up pretty soon. So if you can, go to my website. It's KenMichaelsRadio.com. I'll have a special contest for both those uh, different contests, the, the Beatle books and the Lennon albums on vinyl. Cool. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Alan, Alan, Al, Al, I know you got some com coming up. Right, because this weekend, uh, when uh, when this show airs, it uh, it will be the uh, right in the middle of the Chicago Fest for Beatles fans, which is um, uh, August 14th, 15th, and 16th at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare, uh, just outside of Chicago. So if uh, any of you are still kind of on the fence about going, please, by all means, uh, come by and uh, and if you do come by, I'm going to be all over the place. Uh, so please come by and say hi. Okay, it's Alan, all over you, the place. Yeah, all over the place. Alan, you got anything uh, to to no, mention? No, I'm just going to be floating in my pool this week. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> go Red Sox. Living the life. <laughs> Red Sox. Right. Also, and, since Al mentioned um, the Fest for Beetle fans. Um, I will be a part of Danbury Fields Forever yes. this coming weekend. Oh, that's that's right. uh, on August the 15th on the actual anniversary of the Beatles at Shea. That's at the Charles Ives Center in Danbury, Connecticut. Come by and uh, say hi. I'll be introducing some of the, the Beatles tribute bands there. Say hi to Charles Rosnay. So uh, a lot going on that whole day. There's, uh, I believe Charles said, 11 different bands all performing on stage. Beatles and solo music throughout the whole day. What could be better? And if you go to our Podbean website, Beatles, uh, if you go to podbean.com and look up the uh, our podcast, uh, you'll find the you find our interviews with both Charles Rosenay and Mark Lapidus uh, as uh, two of the mo two of the last five shows we've done. Uh, mm -hmm. We we just did, uh, and you can f actually find uh, all our shows uh, or most of our shows at the Podbean site. And also, they're also streamed on YouTube. But the uh, the Charles show was really cool because he talked yeah. about not only he not only Danbury, but he talked about his uh, the some of the things that have happened to him over the years uh, on his Beatle tours. And Mark surprised the heck out of us with the anecdotes about about Beatle Fest and some of the some of the things that I didn't know about uh, things that had happened at Beetlefest and some of his opinions, including if one of the Beatles was to show at Beetlefest, which one did he think would show up? And I 
was completely caught by surprise by that answer. So those shows are, are online and they're well worth listening to and we hope you'll catch them. Anyway, till next time, on behalf of Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, Ken Michaels, our guest, special guest, Michael Lynch, and myself, Steve Marinucci, thank you for listening and we will see you next time. 